Coming up next on This Week in Computer Hardware, Robert Heron joins me to talk about TVs and video equipment from CES. VR is finally up for pre-order, and we check out all the hardware that was worth seeing at the show. It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 346, recorded on January 14th, 2016, wrapping up CES. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Drobo, a family of safe and expandable yet simple to use storage arrays. Drobos are designed to protect your important data forever. Visit drobo.com slash twit and use the code twit100 to save $100 off a Drobo Mini, Drobo 4Bay, or Drobo 5N. Hey everybody, welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware. I'm Ryan Shrout. Uh, Patrick Norton is off gallivanting around the country today. Uh, so we are joined by fill-in and frequent guests, replacing either me or Patrick, depending on the week, Robert Heron. Uh, thanks for joining us, man. My pleasure. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing well. We were talking before the show about the post-CES stuff. You said you still had like lots of content that you were kind of going through, updating stories, uh, adding video clips. For us, it's kind of been... Honestly, the opposite, like basically a day or two after CES, it was kind of like, okay, well, that's it. Hardware news is kind of done. Um, now what? We kind of move on to the next the next phase of things. But I guess uh, from your perspective on the AV side, there's there's a lot more to cover there than there is on the PC, PC hardware specific side of things, I'm sure. Definitely. It's everything from specs to going through and replacing those those sometimes really terrible pictures they give you in press releases with something <laughs> that shows you were actually standing there. Right. And until you actually can stand in front of the TV and and or whatever display device or home theater product I'm looking at, until you're actually standing in front of it, it's really hard to get past some of the hype because there's always a, a certain way they want to spin any new product from any oh, manufacturer. Yeah. And until you're actually there and you can say, oh, now that I see what you're talking about, it's either way cooler than I thought, or that really doesn't mean anything at all. So those kind of assessments, that kind of uh, just additional information, and just kind of going back over everything I was told and comparing it to, in effect, what I saw last year as well, to see right. what promises were kept, what weren't, and applying that to what I think is going to happen in the next few months. I bet I bet that's an interesting thing to dive into. Is and, and, and it's not something we should probably look into as well. It's like, okay, what did you say you were going to do versus what did you actually do? And having to go back in that kind of postmortem format and looking at, you know, what did you, what actually happened in the last 12 months as opposed to only focusing on the new. Um, but I, I do want to go over a couple of things here. We want to start by uh, looking at your blog, your, your story here about the best TVs of 2016. Looks like you originally posted this on January 5th. So kind of of like right at the beginning of CES, but has since been updated multiple times, I'm sure. Um, so what's your kind of your stance right now on the on your what you expect to be the best TVs as we get into uh, the new year? Well, we're talking specifically about the 4K ultra high definition TVs and a couple of big things have happened in the last few weeks, one being the ultra high definition alliance. Now, this is a group of manufacturers and content producers Specifically, this is going to make it a lot easier for you to pick out what TVs are going to be somewhat future-proofed going forward with mm. new, new and finalized standards like uh, high dynamic range and expanded color palettes. And honestly, th these things were not finalized even a few months ago, and now we finally have terrific new premium models from companies like LG specifically there with their OLED TVs, uh, which were probably, arguably, the biggest eye candy at the show, uh, <laughs> as well as... LCDs from a variety of manufacturers as well. Um, the big deal really is, yeah, there you go, the glass backplane, specifically for LG's OLED, instead of doing, you know, plastic and, and metal and things like that, they took a sheet of glass mm -hmm. and affixed that millimeter thick OLED panel right to the face of it. And I think that looked pretty cool for durability. Sources yeah. of 4K we were just talking about, everything, there's an example of high dynamic range being delivered via YouTube. Uh, and then there's uh, the new designs in particular. I really like that that folding base design of the new OLED panels. But getting back to that uh, high definition alliance, ultra high definition alliance, uh, that's really going to make it a little bit easier for you to pick and choose which TVs you can buy this year that will be future proofed more so than anything that's come before it. 
we we didn't have as many sources of 4K. Uh, mm. We had uh, now we have ultra high definition Blu-ray finally being released coming up in a month or so with a, yeah. a few dozen titles at launch. So uh, this is far better good. than it was uh, even at the launch of Blu-ray in terms of content and availability. <laughs> In addition to all the streaming services and stuff, too, and there's some examples, too, of how else TVs and display panels are being used in addition to just as televisions. In that case, there's a piece of OLED signage demonstrating convex and concave shapes, which is something you may not realize. But they're putting these panels effectively on plastic substrates and being able to and they were demonstrating this anyway, either double sided where they are a couple millimeters thick with two independent displays smacked together. Or in that case, just showing off what what beautiful color and brightness and eye catchingness you can create with something like a wall. And that also is a double sided display, but a little bit thicker hmm. in terms of design. But um, I, I'm really pleased to say that if you have waited until now and you're looking at the premium models, there are some there's going to be a handful of great TVs out there. And that neat. Uh, one of the interesting things about the ultra high definition alliance is that they've they've kind of drawn a line down the, the technology, so to speak, and said, we have slightly different specs that we're requiring for OLED TVs, the organic light emitting diode TVs versus the LCDs uh, that we're all pretty familiar with. Uh, effectively, in the current state of things, OLED simply can't match the brightness of today's LCDs. You can you can put more light out with an LCD. However, OLEDs hmm. can do black that's darker than an LCD, generally right. speaking. And, and so they've created two specific uh, qualifications for each panel type. So in the case of... Uh, in the case of OLED versus LCD, you're talking about the LCDs are effectively required to put out almost twice as much light, yet the OLEDs have the advantage of literally perfect black in, in terms of being able to produce contrast. So, hmm. And when I say that OLEDs are putting out half as much light as what an LCD will be required, we're still talking very bright light output levels uh, in excess of what previous generations of LCDs have put out before. So we're not talking like dim in any way shape or form it's just that maybe if you're looking at uh, a room environment where you will be challenged with the amount of light in the room you may mm -hmm. still want to go with lcd technology and or it may be way more affordable than even the latest generation right. of oleds even though prices still continue to come down across the board but now, between that and between this just this general assortment of where you can get this content now and and finalized formats like hdr 10 or dolby vision uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's really, it's now to the point where everyone has specs they can work with. They're producing displays and content that go along with that. And it's just a, it's a happy melting pot at this point. So it's interesting because the HDR side is, is interesting to me because of kind of a push from companies like AMD and NVIDIA. When we met with AMD uh, in December, they talked very specifically about the introduction of HDR displays. Is that something that you think will be significantly more common as we get through the rest of 2016 that you'll see TVs and maybe even monitors using HDR display technology? It, it'll say yes, but it will say more about the capability of the display device than anything else because it, it really requires exceptional light output to be able to either do a pinpoint prick of light or, or say even like a 10% size window if you're trying to average it out a little bit. It has to be able to put out a certain amount of light. If we're talking LCD display systems, and then it also has to be able to simultaneously display very good dark detail. And that's going to be a challenge for any LCD, uh, let alone on the desktop side of things. But right. there's no reason a graphics card shouldn't support that. And high dynamic range imagery, if, if you've had a chance to preview some of the content from Amazon yeah. currently on, on premium TVs, that content just looks more natural to me. It looks It's the most realistic window-like interface uh, or, or, or video that I've ever looked at to date. Uh, from any source, and I'm looking mm. forward to looking at ultra high definition Blu-ray. But but if you can bring that level of of wow, here here is lighting and and detail that comes closer to what it looks like in the real world. I want that on my desktop, and if I can have a graphics card deliver that kind of technology, yep. uh, I, I want it to support that, and it should. They should be and, there and at the forefront of all of this. The, the transition of all these technologies usually depends greatly on content availability, and one of the benefits that PCs, especially PC gaming has is that it creates the content on the fly, right? So game engines can very easily convert to uh, HDR output as long as there are, is display availability, uh, which is which is pretty interesting as well. So uh, oh. I do want to ask one question on that Samsung uh, page you have here. Did you see that monitor in person? Is the bezel really that small or is that like 
trick photography. Total BS. Uh, it was, it, I didn't see any bezel display anywhere on okay. the show floor. I, and that was really one of the first things I looked at. And I actually, I'll be updating that article later today with some okay. close-ups of that very bezel. It is, it is very thin and at a distance, you really don't notice it too much, but there's a bezel right. there. Uh, yeah. they did demonstrate some ultra thin display designs as well, uh, on the show floor. They had a new model coming up. It didn't have a model number, but, uh, I had a hint as to what it would be called. And that really, it is a focus on the pixels themselves. And, and in particular for, for one thing that really did stand out to me for Samsung's LCD tech for 2016 was how much improved off axis viewing was for the LCD panels. Typically when you get off axis with a VA, a vertically aligned style panel design, uh, you suddenly lose your contrast and your color saturation and, and things like halos become far more noticeable. Samsung has done a lot in, in one generation to really improve upon how those artifacts appear. And I was, I was very impressed. And they did have, um, even though the, everything on the show floor that was public was all edgelet, they did demonstrate mm -hmm. a full array local dimming set in the back room that they'll be bringing out okay. later this year as well. That should be their, one of their ultra premium sets for the year. So I'm really gotcha. looking forward to that as well. But, but off axis performance, I was like, ah, they really need to improve this. That's, that was the thought I had in the back of my head last year. They did it for this year. And I, I'm looking, I'm hoping that carries through to the entire model line for the SUHD TVs from Samsung. So, uh, cool. Looking, looking forward to it. Yeah. Uh, speaking of displays, I think something else that both of us are, are excited about, uh, is the VR display market that will will be blowing up i think in 2016 uh both oculus and htc announced their pre-orders and went through their whole pre-order campaigns the, the oculus rift uh was announced at the price of 599 dollars shipping on march 28th although pre-orders at for that time frame are already well beyond sold out uh, i think we're into the may time frame for estimated delivery if you go there today um it comes with uh the rift goggles obviously it has integrated uh, uh, integrated uh, headphones on it, I guess I should say. You get an Xbox One controller. You get a uh, camera that sits on on the top of your display that it uses to track the device, uh, you know, some with IR light. And you get like a little uh, uh, remote control as well. Um, the 599 price seemed to surprise a lot of people. It didn't really surprise me. I think it surprised people because, you know, when you first got that, that development kit, like the first... Uh, Oculus DK1 that we have over here, it was like 300 bucks. That's all it took. Uh, but it was an unfinished device. They didn't, um, the, you know, the display in it was very, uh, uh, I don't know, low, re it was low resolution, low refresh rate, uh, high pixel persistence uh, compared to what you get uh, with the the screen that's going to be the actual consumer shipping rift. Uh, so that that announcement was made, and the HTC Vive pre-orders are going to start on February 29th, so you can't actually pre-order it yet, but it will um, still apparently ship in March as well. So um, you'll be able to pre-purchase that, and I, I don't think we have a price for that one yet either. Um, have you tried either of these out? And, and what do you think only, about the idea of like the five ninety nine price tag that we now know for the Rift? Initial pricing for any consumer electronics product, I almost ignore it. I, that's an early adopter price. And I guarantee you if it becomes popular, the price is going to come down and the quality will get better in short order. So, you know, it, it, there was nothing else like it before that. And the closest thing I have in my hands right now anyway would be like Google's Cardboard, which honestly – that to me is just as impressive as anything. Having just yeah. something that simple that you can literally slap your phone into and go, or in the case of Samsung's Gear VR, uh, that'll mm -hmm. probably be because I happen to have a Samsung phone. I will likely drop ninety nine bucks just to have that in my hand as well for for just getting my feet wet. But but having a high performance three uh, D vision system uh, with incredible frame rate, head tracking, and head movement. So right. all of that put together with with the audio, I, I'm I, I'm. I've been a poo-pooing 3D for computer systems for 30 years, and right. <laughs> I, I've, I've seen it. It keeps coming. It's popular for a couple of weeks or months, and then it just kind of goes back into the woods again. This seems to be a little more permanent in terms of its staying power and, and the excitement around it. I'm seeing a lot of cool things developed for it. I, I really do kind of hope it takes off because, uh, uh, you know, I hope this is not another case of liquid crystal shutter glasses that – you know, are, are here right. and eh, it's okay, but I ain't going to use or, or I buy it and it just sits in the drawer for 
you know, weeks and months. That's, that's pretty much my, that, that was my experience with the 3d TVs. Uh, but I, I will say like the, the corporate giants that are in this now and the money that they've invested in, I don't think this is going to be a several month to a year kind of gimmick that kind of, uh, goes away. Um, and and I will say, if you haven't tried, if, for anybody listening, not just you, Robert, who hasn't tried, you know the, the the newest shipping version of the Rift or the newest version of the HTC Vive, that you really you really should try it because um, the difference between the initial versions and what is shipping is dramatic, and the difference between uh, Oculus Rift and HTC Vive and what you get out of something like uh, the Samsung Gear VR is also going to be dramatically different, right? So. No matter how you spin it, the compute power you get out of uh, a high-end smartphone is minuscule compared to the compute power you'll get out of a, a decent gaming PC. And that difference shows in the content and how it reacts and latency and, and, and there's all kinds of improvements that have gone on in that regard. Um, I, there are, there's a lot of people complaining about the 599 price tag because I think everyone expected it to be around 350 based on comments that Palmer Lucky and, and Oculus had been saying for some time, but... Uh, it doesn't surprise me to see it at this. That is essentially a high-end console price tag. You just happen to have to have a thousand plus dollar PC to hook it up to it. Um, so it, it is, as you mentioned, early adapter pricing is always going to get you. Uh, and in this case, no exception to the rule, I guess. Um, yeah, I'm one of those people who really, I don't dive immediately into new technology. I'll, I'll check it right. out and give my opinion about it, of course. But um, I, I'd rather take a wait and see approach and get better value. In the end, yep. however, you know, and I think, I think like that's fair. Performance is there, though, and that's really the big deal about systems like Oculus and what HTC is doing. Having having increased resolution. My biggest complaint currently about using my cell phone as a 3D display: one, the motion tracking, uh, especially for the whole body, and two, resolution. It's it's still mm -hmm. not detailed enough, or I have to move yep. a little too slow to keep the effect good. And those right. are the things I'm looking forward to seeing improved upon. Yep. And, I, and I, so we'll know, I mean, March 28th is when the first units will be shipping. And I imagine the day or so after that, we'll have a whole lot more uh, of people's individual experiences to base uh, to base that opinion on. Um, well, let's take a quick break here and thank today's sponsor of This Week in Computer Hardware. Uh, we are pleased to welcome back Drobo to the Twit Network. They are sponsoring this episode. Uh, digital data is essential to our lives. And you're looking at two people who understand that to the fullest extent. Um, Drobo is a safe, simple, and expandable solution for all of your storage needs. They offer fam uh, an entire family of external storage arrays. Uh, you can order them preloaded with hard drives or you know, bring your own drives if you want. Uh, if you're looking for a network attached storage solution, either as a local backup solution or to use as a server, you should check out the Drobo 5N. It's simple to use. Getting started is as easy as plugging it into your switch or router. And from personal experience, I can tell you that's Pretty much exactly the case uh, in terms of setup and customer usage. These are the easiest you'll find by far. Uh, they have apps that let you back up data to two different cloud service providers or sync via BitTorrent Sync. Uh, if you have uh, multiple devices or another uh, storage solution you want to back up to, it includes a quad-core ARM processor. Three of the cores are available to run Linux. So that's kind of where those apps come into place as well. Tools for developers include a full LAMP stack, Node.js, and WordPress. It also supports C, C++, Go, Perl, Python, and Ruby, as well as uh, Git. It's, it's a really interesting combination of, of hardware and software in this. It's, it's what, you could, what you could do with these, uh, this, this kind of software stack there is, is nice. Uh, they're great if you work with video, photos, or want to set up your own media server even. They're reliable. Data received by your Drobo uh, and not yet written to disk is protected if there's a sudden power loss. Even better, Drobos have an internal e-USB device where data is copied if there's a power failure to protect against long outages. That's nice. Expandable. You can add or replace drives in your Drobo with ease. No tools required. And the Beyond RAID technology lets you expand on the fly, mix and match drives and capacities. It's simple. The colored lights on the front of the Drobo communicate status. Uh, you got red, yellow, green. Um, green is all good. Red means you should probably replace that drive. Uh, and it's fast. So they have uh, models that support Thunderbolt, Gigabit Ethernet, USB 3.0 connections, uh, and an SSD hot cache accelerates database and small file reads. Uh, if you want more information, you just need to visit drobo.com slash twit to learn more and check out their complete line of products. And when you use the code twit100, you'll save $100 off the purchase of a Drobo Mini, Drobo 4Bay, or a Drobo 5N. 
That's drobo.com slash twit and use the code twit100. And obviously, we thank Drobo for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. Uh, so let's move on to, so we didn't do a CES show. Patrick and I apologize for that profusely, but our schedules were just slam packed. I was actually flying during our normal recording time as well, coming back home early, uh, from the mess that is Las Vegas. But I do have a handful of things I thought we'd want to talk about on today's show. Not go into all of the detail uh, about what I saw at CES. If you want, to, if you really do want that, if you go to pcper.com/ces, you will see a news post from everything we saw, uh, hardware-wise, at uh, the Consumer Electronics Show. Which is uh, there's a lot of stuff there. There's a lot of stuff there. Give yourself some time, make some coffee, do whatever you need to do. Um, <laughs> First up, this one is interesting. EVGA, known for known mostly for graphics cards, uh, but they have also been in the motherboard business for some time, uh, is making a gaming case. And it's not just a gaming case, guys. It is like an enormous gaming case. Um, it has probably more space in it than anything I, I have seen. It, the design is incredibly interesting because they actually... They envision it being used where the window is facing you. So basically rotate the, the, the entire case 90 degrees on its base, right? You're not rotating any of the internal components. You're just making it so like the, the video cards are facing you. The window is facing you. Basically, you know, the idea, and it kind of makes sense if you think about it, is if you're going to spend this kind of money on this case or you're going to spend this money on all the components inside and make it all pretty looking, that you should actually be able to enjoy the view uh, when actually using the computer, um, which I think, you know, makes sense there. Uh, it, it's got, you know, clever little things here for, you know, hiding all the cables coming out of the back so that uh, when you do have it rotated 90 degrees, it still looks clean and they don't have to do anything dramatic in terms of internal hardware. Um, on the bottom, the the power button is actually on the bottom right-hand corner of the window, right? So you get an idea of kind of, again, how they're going to face it. And there's a a fan controller there that in this version uh, has like, you know, four main buttons. It's kind of a, a giant L LED, you know, display in there uh, just to give you the information. But they're actually going to, on the higher end model, offer a full touchscreen LCD down there uh, that will do fan control. But it'll also let you monitor your GPU performance, your CPU performance, temperatures internally, anything that you could do through their EVGA precision, precision software accessible through there. Um, lots of space for it, you know, cable grommets, cable routing. Um, it's a really nice looking piece of hardware. And more interestingly is they, they're going to have multiple models and they say targeting $79 on the low end and $299 on the high end, yet still maintain an all metal construction throughout all those price ranges, whether that be two models or something else in between. Um, I, it's it, the, interesting. To say yeah, the least, I, I, if I needed a case and I was going to support four graphics cards and the hydro cooling that they're rolling in a system like that, you're going to need a case something of that size to begin with. Yeah. I'll be curious to see, though, if they if they do anything with like a micro ATX size design where I, I don't need more than a single graphics card at this point. Um, so or at least I don't want more than one. I'll, I'd rather spend sure. an extra on one really good one. Uh, but I do like the idea of hydro cooling things and I'd like a little extra room for that. But. Man, that's a big case. <laughs> it's just a giant what? system. So, but if you're rolling four four GPUs and the cooling to do it all, uh, yeah, you're going to need that kind of space. And and the design looks fantastic. So, is is the lack of there are no optical bay capabilities on this case? Does that ruin it for you? Not at all. I honestly, really? uh, I I, okay. I have I have a couple external drives that I keep around just in case. My current workstation has a couple of Blu-ray drives in it just for right. that kind of work but i how often do i actually use them almost never anymore um and if i do like i said i have um, a couple of usb two or three um, um either cd or dvd even blu-ray drives just in case right. um i've right. kind of just moved them to external products anyway because if i'm not if i'm not using them in my desktop and i almost i, I don't think i'll ever buy another notebook again that has an integrated optical drive Agreed. so i'm you know uh, it's one of those accessories that i find Sure, I might have a few of them still laying around, but do I actually use them very often? No. Yeah, that's. I, I just thought I thought maybe you would be more attached to the optical media world than that. Josh, uh, one of the guys that works for me, is every time we build a system and we don't include an optical drive, he usually complains to me in some in some capacity. <laughs> so, but uh, I do have some I, I'm with you. Games, but 
Uh, yeah. Even those, it's like I'd almost rather just wait for a Steam sale, pick up my classic game in a digital yeah. downloadable format, and then keep it, my if they still in storage. <laughs> if if they ship Windows on a USB thumb drive now, I think everything should move on to that. I think exactly. that's the bar. Uh, interestingly, so Monoprice, a company that both of us know very well, um, it, we we know from like, hey, you need good quality really good pricing cables and adapters and things like that, right? That's what Monoprice was uh, for as long as I can remember. Um, they started branching out into monitors and they did, they did some other stuff, you know, video converters. Um, they're really mixing things up in 2016, apparently. They're releasing uh, several printers, and I mean 3D printers, right? So $199 uh, 3D printer here, the uh, Maker Spark 3D printer, and a $299, $299 Maker DLP 3D printer, and then a uh, $999 Maker CNC mill. Uh, and so the Sebastian wrote this up for us. You can see some photos there of uh, the fairly basic, you know, Spark 3D printer that you get there. Um, for $199, is is kind of insane to think about, right? That this technology has gotten to this to this point. Now, do you have any? I know Patrick loves to play with three D printers. Do you have any experience using those as well? Just pretty basic stuff. However, the other day I needed literally. Uh, I lost a knob for a lamp, and I was thinking, you know what? I like the lamp. I'm missing this <laughs> small, simple, relatively simple part. And then somebody suggested, oh, you know, you can go online. There are hundreds of knobs that have already been prefabbed by other people. Find the one you need, do the measurements real quick, download the file, bring it over and we'll print it out for you. And I'm like, I love that idea. So if you can get that price down to 99 bucks for something that allows you to create either brand new stuff or maybe a replacement part or something like that, that's, yeah. that's freaking awesome. That thousand dollar CNC machine though, piques my interest for a variety of reasons. I, I, I would like to do some basic metal work with it. And I'm curious to see what the performance and limitations are of that. And that's something I'm going to be digging into. I didn't, had no idea that Monoprice was doing any kind of CNC offerings as well. But considering they offer musical instruments in addition to speaker wire and everything else, yeah, uh, I guess I shouldn't be surprised. So they also, uh, I don't think we had a news post on it, but they also are going to be selling a uh, drone that has like some ridiculous, like 75 mile an hour top speed to it. Uh, what do they call it? The, the rotating uh, blade uh, uh, drones. It, uh, they, they, they've branched out. Like, it, like so it's like, or? yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's like, you guys, you guys used to sell DVI to VGA adapters pretty much exclusively. Like that's what, that's what it came from. And so they're just, they're branching out. They're finding things that um, are fairly well made. I mean, obviously, Monoprice isn't manufacturing these things. They're finding them overseas and sourcing them and bringing them over here, just like they did with uh, when they started selling uh, their own kind of branded monitor, right? They were taking Korean monitors that people, you know, had had fallen in love with the price and the features, bringing them over, applying them a little bit higher cost, but applying a better warranty for you. Uh, and I imagine that's what they're going to do with this. So I, I'm eager. I have, I have literally zero experience with the 3d printers, uh, of, of today. Um, other than seeing some demos when I go to these shows. So I would love to be able to get one in and see what garbage I could make. Right. Cause that's pretty much what I feel like I would do at least initially. Um, but the idea of replacing broken parts, uh, with something that you can just, print locally is is pretty awesome so yeah that and the and cnc that, machine are both interesting it really ties back into that whole maker you know sense and as yeah. well as uh, companies like iFixit who are like why are you just throwing away something that that can be repaired or replaced uh mm -hmm. with with a simple fix and and if you can and the library of 3d objects that are out there that people said you know what so, you don't even have to start from scratch anymore chances are somebody's already crafted that part and released it into an open place where you can look through a library of, of 3d parts and then find the one that comes close and tweak it to your liking and, and go from there and having having something at the 199 price point though uh you know that that did not exist very too many months ago so to speak right and uh i'm glad right. to see it i really really am uh, I'm curious what your opinion is on the idea of these compute sticks, right? So uh, Intel announced at CES updated versions of their compute stick. They have an updated Atom version, but maybe more impressively, they are releasing core ver uh, Intel core-based versions of these, which are just going to be higher performance. Um, core, there's two of them, one based on the Core M... 
Uh, these model numbers get me every time. The Core M3 6Y30 processor, the Core M5 6Y57 processor. Um, you know, these are essentially the same form factor that we saw before, but new improvements, additional USB ports. Uh, there's a Type-C connector on there, uh, but they are, imagine a giant USB thumbsticks, but instead of a USB port, you have an HDMI port on the back, meant to plug directly into a TV or a monitor, uh, act as a PC, uh, you can connect Bluetooth, keyboard and mouse, wired keyboard and mouse if you really want to. Uh, they've updated these to 802.11ac 2x2 radios on them to try to improve their streaming capability. And the new processors mean uh, that you should have no issues basically running any video, any video decode operations across them. Um, they're a little bit more expensive than I would like, especially the Core M variants. Uh, they're going to be, let's see... Uh, the Core M3 variant is $299, but that is without um, Windows, I believe. Yeah, and for $399, you get it with a copy of Windows 10 pre-installed. And then if you want the Core M5 variant, which is the higher performance model, uh, it's $499, but without an OS. And this is apparently targeted at business markets that will have their own images to install to them, uh, etc. Both of them, or all three of them, rather, shipping in February. Um is this something, so I, you know, you, you obviously spend a lot of time thinking about home theater PCs and the like. Is this something that you have considered before or would consider for home theater PC devices just because of their form factor? I would think so. Uh, in the home theater space, it would be nice just to have that device, especially as I'm looking more toward NAS devices for external storage anyway. Mm -hmm. And if there's, mm -hmm. enough, if there's enough storage internally within the stick to accommodate the OS and just getting it booted and connected to my network, that could be a very interesting home theater project right there. In addition, if, if for people like, say, my parents who need very simplified computing needs, uh, granted, I've, I pretty much moved them almost exclusively over to tablet use at this point. But having, say, the living room TV, that's a nice giant display already, uh, you know, high resolution, so forth and so on. To be able just to say, you know what, you can use the universal remote, hit the computer button, and it goes right to the computer that's sitting there waiting for them. And it provides right. the basic needs in, 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 a, in a performance package that isn't, doesn't feel like you're making any trade-offs. That was always my biggest complaint previously was, oh, I'm, I'm doing this on a, a weakened Android operating system. Or I'm doing this with Atom, old school Atom processors that are great for single tasks. But man, you start trying to multitask in any way, shape, or form. And you're, you're waiting and waiting and waiting. Uh, and if I can get around all of those little issues and just put the computer right into a TV easily and take up very little to no room, I think that's a that's a there are some use cases there where I would be very interested in exploring it further and checking it out because I'm also a big fan of Intel's Nook, their next unit of computing yep. pro, pro, products. Those to me are more my style because at least I can put they have they have case models that have uh, room for an SSD in addition mm -hmm. to M2 storage as well. So. I can create a very high performance system with storage built in and something, you know, a, a quarter the size of a shoebox. And right. those are also right up my alley in terms of things I would really look at next. Because yeah. the primary reason I have a workstation is for multi-monitor support and, and PC gaming graphics cards. Uh, that's really what it is. And if I don't have that need, then you know what? I can really simplify the hardware needs and get it down to something that's entirely usable. Uh, and if I can yeah. do it from the comfort of my couch in the living room, even better. <laughs> yeah, the the Nook is actually when I I built a computer. My dad wanted to do uh, uh, remote control airplanes, but he wanted to be able to practice during the winter when he couldn't go outside. So I was like, okay, I'll build your computer, hooked it up to your TV, and that's what I use. Is I use a Nook for that. It was very simplistic. Um, but had more than enough power to do what he wanted to do. Uh, but you still get the capabilities of onboard storage or whatever. Because these are limited to, I think the Atom version is 32 gigs and uh, the Core M versions are 64 gigs of internal storage. So after that, you're you're looking at USB storage or, or NAS storage, as you were mentioning there. So those will be available uh, starting next month. And now, if you want to go in the complete opposite direction in terms of systems, um, their MSI released one called the Vortex at, at CES. Now, this is a um, similar shape and size to a Mac Pro, one of the new cylindrical Mac Pros. And this device holds in it, it has, uh, it had a, a full performance desktop quad-core processor. It has two 
up to two GTX 980 GPUs in it. Um, and then all the associated connectivity and storage and options that you would expect there. You know, multiple M.2 ports. Uh, you've got two Thunderbolt, two USB 3.1 ports. Uh, you, you know, you've got HDMI outputs in there. And it uses, a, like, you know, as the video is showing here, a Vortex 360 fan. It's supposed to be pre relatively quiet. I will say it wasn't really quiet when I was standing next to it. And uh, it was playing uh, through some of the Witcher 3 in its dual 980 configuration. But if you look at the video and you see the size comparison... <clears throat> the 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 i guess that comparison to a mac pro is very very apt right it's clearly where they got the inspiration from this one has uh, rgb compatible lighting so that's you know advantage msi there obviously but you know you get a full size quad core hyper threaded skylake processor and two geforce gtx 980ms and that and that sh size of a device um and it looks good at the same time this is something that even if you are a hardcore PC gamer and you want to hook it up to one of those new 4K TVs that we were talking about at the beginning of the show, this is the type of all-in-one that you can get. Now, you're going to have to pay for it. You're looking between three dollars and $4,000 to get the fully specced out model of this. Uh, but they do have one that has a pair of GTX 960s uh, and a Core i5 instead of a Core i7 processor. And I think it starts at $19.99. Um, so... I think that is a March, April timeframe release product for that. Um, but an interesting a, comparison fantastic. looking at the computer. I love the, the design of that. I think that would be yeah. ult the ultimate LAN party box and having yeah. a, a, a compact unit that can have dual graphic, dual GPU setups in it with, with you know, sky's the limit as far as the CPU yeah. power you need, RAM, storage, all of it. Uh, and, and I like that centralized cooling. And I, I would probably tweak it a little bit more to be quiet, uh, yet still provide plenty of oomph. But damn, I, I like the way it looks. That's a that's a clever design. And yeah, it's clearly it's, borrowing a little bit, though, from Apple. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's pretty obvious that it is. Uh, and you've got all the display connect connectivity, right? So if you want to hook up four monitors to this, you can absolutely do that. You can run in NVIDIA surround gaming if you want. Um, it, it really doesn't have any sacrifices other than a lot of upgradability, but like the processor itself is socketed. So if you wanted to replace the processor, you could. Uh, and I believe the cool, the GPUs are actually just on MXM modules. So if you could, you know, if you could find replacement MXM modules down the road, you might be able to replace those as well. Uh, although they're not guaranteeing that really in any form, but uh, that's the MSI Vortex. It was a really neat thing that some every once in a while you get things that surprise you uh, when you go to CS. And then I, I wanted to end on or, or close nearly end on this one. This one I thought was really interesting. And this was my first experience with a larger OLED screen, right? So I'd, I'd had OLED phones and tablets before, but Lenovo announced the ThinkPad X1 Yoga with an OLED screen. And the, the presentation that they brought for us was like, okay, here's both identical machines. One's going to be offered with OLED. One's going to be offered with offered with standard LED LCD. Um, and the difference was instantaneously noticeable. Uh, and for people, you know, we like we took video of it. You can take photographs of it, but it's very, very difficult to demonstrate the advantages of OLED, especially when people are watching it on standard screens and you're taking pictures of it with you know photos or, or with, with with digital cameras and whatnot. Um, it's really a much like I think VR or 3D, it's something you kind of have to see in person for you to really appreciate what OLED offers. Um, and this is this was a $200 upgrade over the standard screen on uh, on this particular model of machine. So, curious on your thoughts on this. Is this is OLED a technology you want to see in your next laptop? And um, is do you think $200 uh, probably by by mid this this year, they'll have that one out. And maybe they said April or May. Uh, is that kind of like a reasonable upcharge, you think? I I do indeed. Uh, my biggest complaint about notebook displays in particular, unless they're IPS panels, uh, generally is viewing angles. And as soon as you move on my notebook in particular, if I'm not right in the sweet spot, it is I have severe uniformity issues with the display right. itself. The, the top might be brighter than the bottom, or it changes depending on the angle of the screen. OLED makes a lot of that go away. There are still, you still lose light output when you move off axis with the OLED panel in the Lenovo uh, X1 Yoga. And I had had some hands-on time with it at the show uh, at the Lenovo party. And, and the only 
degradation I noticed off axis was just simply some light output gets lost. However, uh, the black level maintains and the key there is that when you have inky dark black, there's a, there's a, there's a biomechanical function that makes color look brighter and pop better when it's, when it's mm. side by side with something that's super dark. Uh, likewise, if, if the screen is a little grayer, the blacks are a little brighter, uh, colors look a little more washed out. So even with even if it might measure the same color wise, visually that that OLED just makes everything pop a little bit better. And for me, just the the better performance of off axis viewing is is key. I don't know if you're really going to have any energy consumption savings. I'd like to see the difference there if there's a difference in battery life between mm. the LCD and the OLED model. But overall, that's just it, it's a thin and light notebook, and yep. I think it's even I think it's sub two pounds. And it was just, that's exactly what I, for my next gen notebook, uh, the, decent it's, integrated it's, it's, graphics. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, it's interesting you bring up the power consumption thing. Cause that's my biggest question on it as well. Because if you, those two devices, um, that we got to see the OLED was actually rated at a lower, uh, battery life. I think it went from 11 down to nine hours of battery life and the OLED one had a bigger battery in it. So based on their testing, the OLED screen is using more power to get the output that it has. Now, they, their comment to me on that was that uh, the battery test, kind of this industry standard battery test called Mobile Mark 2014 that they use uh, does a, spends a lot of its time in like the Microsoft Office environment, which uses a lot of white backgrounds and white imagery and white uses a lot of basically your white is the worst possible case for an OLED screen in terms of power consumption whereas black you're basically using no power so um i think in their mind they're hoping to find other workloads like maybe general consumer workloads how much of your screen is light how much of it is dark and how that uh, might affect you know actual real world consumption on a per display per display basis um, it, it's something I've been trying to think about a little bit since, uh, since CES, like when I'm looking through different web pages, it's like, okay, I go to YouTube, I go to Gmail. That's a lot of white there. You know, Twitter has a lot of white on it. Oh, but you know, this website I go to, this forum I go to has a lot of deep red in it, you know, so that that'll be less power, uh, less of a power concern on an OLED screen. It, it kind of stinks that you even have to think about that type of stuff because it's, just a different uh, direction for things. Um, but it is it is worth noting that, you know, Lenovo noticed the problem and was trying to compensate at least some by increasing the battery size as well. So hopefully it doesn't become a huge problem um, going forward. If the, differences with these. Are, if the differences are relatively minor, I would, I would always lean toward the OLED display for a mobile device right. anyway. I, I'm curious to know who actually manufactures that panel if it, if it's, you could, you could probably look at it with a jeweler's loop and determine by the pic, sub pixel structure who who's right. whose tech it is. So I'd, right. I'd be curious to see. Yep, me too. Um, and then I guess one more, one last story uh, from CES. Just wanted to to show that we had a video of this at, at one point. The the Polaris architecture for AMD they kind of officially unveiled uh, right at the beginning of CES. Polaris is going to be the architecture that. Um, follows up Fiji that followed up Hawaii. Um, and we don't know a whole much, a whole bunch about this other than, you know, it's got an updated GCN architecture uh, with some improved hardware features. Uh, it has next generation display engine, which is interesting for all of us. HDMI 2.0A is supported. DisplayPort 1.3 is supported. Um, and along with DP 1.3 comes that HDR uh, display support as well, kind of integrated in that. H.265 encode and decode support as well. Um, it's it seems to be a, a a fantastic push forward architecturally, um, but the only thing they're really talking about now is power efficiency, not like peak performance, like what their next flagship GPU is going to offer, uh, but they are talking about hey, this architecture is going to be significantly more efficient than our last one, because that was really where they were falling behind uh, uh, Nvidia's GeForce line uh, in terms of product right you could amd could match performance but they're always consistently using a lot more power which for the desktop market maybe not a huge concern but definitely it was it's becoming a concern uh, but if you wanted to put if you wanted to have your gpu in a gaming notebook for example that's a big deal then so uh you know they're hopeful that this means uh better results for them on the mainstream cards and below uh getting into no gaming notebooks um because that's what they were talking about was efficiency uh they showed they had a demo of uh, the new Star Wars Battlefront game running at 1080p, 60 hertz, 
uh, and they were comparing an unnamed Polaris GPU to a GTX 950, uh, and whole system power consumption was about, I don't know, 50 watts, 55 watts lower on the new AMD Polaris part than the NVIDIA part, and that's significant. Um, but there's a lot of questions, obviously, in terms of if you uncapped the frame rate, what would your performance actually be and, and all that. So this, is, this, is, this will be the first new GPU built on 16, 14 nanometer FinFET technology. So that's where we're getting a, a huge amount of this performance efficiency. Uh, and uh, that'll be, they say, mid-2016 for that release. So... The HDMI 2.0A and the DisplayPort 1.3 specs, uh, those are right in line with what I'll need in a mobile device going forward anyway when I go to calibrate high dynamic range displays. True. It, it, it is a challenging mess at the moment to work with these displays. And the current software packages I'm using currently only support uh, Intel graphics and AMD graphics. Uh, they oh. haven't, they, they're not quite solidified yet with uh, NVIDIA's hardware. So... Hmm. I, I'm actually looking forward to seeing what the latest gen of AMD hardware is going to be doing as far as uh, mobile mobile graphics go. And uh, cool. that's exactly what I need. <laughs> well, I'm sure like they'll be glad the to hear hardware that. support. Yeah. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, that and everything they're showing, too, in terms of having a, a HDR10 support, that means that they have the capability there where they could add in support for any of the other high dynamic range formats going forward. And and probably as well, uh, expanded color palette is, and, and beyond. Currently, the way they're doing it is actually encoding, I believe, a they're basically putting a 10 to 12 bit encode within the 8-bit RGB output of a notebook in order to do the HDR from PCs currently. And gotcha. that's being detected and processed properly. So, you know, just just having, I would like to have an HDMI 2.0A compatible output on, on a notebook hardware device that I'm trying to use in my in yeah. my workflow for calibration. So that's something that's something I'm currently evaluating and I'll be paying close attention to this going forward. We'll have it we'll have it soon for you, it sounds like. Nice. Uh, I think <laughs> I think that's going to wrap up uh, our show for us this week, guys. We'll be back next week. Um, Robert, thanks for filling in. What do you do other than uh, take either my or Patrick's space on this show on a seemingly weekly basis these days? I, In addition to doing uh, calibration work for clientele here in the Bay Area, I also uh, write for my own website at Heron Fidelity. I cover a lot of display technology there and home theater gear. In addition to I also uh, work independently for manufacturers directly. Sometimes okay. I get a chance to basically go into the depths of their environments, look at something brand new and evaluate how the press will think about it before it actually comes out and give them some feedback. Hopefully, hopefully improve anything I touch and look at. So cool. uh, I do it all. Anything and everything related to either display <laughs> devices or, or home theater. I'm uh, working in it. Great. Uh, as ever, you can find all of our stuff over at PCPro.com. I'm going to go ahead and plug. We just launched a Patreon campaign for PC Perspective. So if you guys are interested in that and you read PC Per a lot, watch that podcast as well. Feel free to go to Patreon.com slash PC Per. Read up on that, why we're doing that, and uh, help out if you can. Otherwise, we'll still be posting all of our reviews and videos and whatnot at, uh, at the main PCPer.com site. Uh, that's going to be it for us for next week. I think both uh, both Patrick and I will be back. So, Robert, maybe you get a week off. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Always a pleasure being here. So, awesome. anytime Great. I can help out, let me know. Will do. See you next time, guys. Bye.